how gold has lost its luster. The fine gold become dull. The sacred gems are scattered at the head of every street. How precious, sons of Zion, once worth their weight in gold, are now considered as pots of clay and the work of a potter's hands. Even jackals offer their breasts to nurse their young. But my people have become heartless like ostriches in the desert. Because of thirst, the infant's tongue sticks to the roof of its mouth. The children beg for bread, but no one gives it to them. Those who once ate delicacies are destitute in the streets. Those nurtured in purple now lie in ash heaps. The punishment of my people is greater than that of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment without a hand turned to help her. Their princes were brighter than, than snow and whiter than milk. Their bodies more ruby than rubies and their appearance like sapphires. But now they are blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the street. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as a stick. Those killed by the sword. Sorry, I just lost my place. Those killed by the sword are better off than those who die in famine. Racked with hunger, they waste away for lack of food from the field. With their own hands, compensate, uh, compassion, uh, with their own hands, compassionate women have cooked their own children who became their food when my people were destroyed. The Lord has given full vent to his wrath. He has poured out his fierce anger. These are strong words. There is something about wasted glory, wasted potential. We notice it, I think, most amongst young people when they're growing up and we see them grow up and we have a smile about our face when we see how beautiful they become when they move from infancy into, into toddler and then they begin moving around and we see them and we see their smile, we see their strength, we see their intelligence, we see uh, their big word potential. And we think, oh, that child can really grow into being something special. But then round about teenage years, when uh, I say roundabout, because it kind of is like that. We say it's like a fork in the road, you know, when they come to the place of decision, when they can go right or left, and we're all sitting back in tense, you know, anticipation, hoping that right decisions are made as they come to this. But sometimes it is more like a roundabout than it is a fork in the road. You know, there are several different ways they could go. And they just kind of circle, and you can see the wheels begin to spin. No adult can make the decision for them. They have to make this decision on their own. Instead, we sit on the edge of our seats watching them, hoping and praying that they'll make the right choices, that they'll get off at the right exit, that they won't head the wrong way. And we watch them begin to contemplate in making these decisions. We have trained them up in the way that they should go, but now that they're on that roundabout, the decision is theirs and theirs alone, and we watch them. When they take the right exit, we rejoice. Yes! Glory! You know, oh, I'm so pleased. Oh, and we hug them and they get embarrassed. And we say, I'm so happy for you, doing so well. Oh, the man you've met is just a lovely Christian man. And I can just see the potential of a good home coming your way with loads of children. And, you know, and, oh, they're scared. You, know, but you can just begin to see. And then, on the other hand, we begin to see sometimes and we say, wish they wouldn't have gone that way. I wish they hadn't taken that exit. Ooh, it's not that they can't get back on the right road, but ooh, there's a lot of potholes in that one. There's a lot of um, 
No, it's a dangerous road. A lot of people have been killed on that road. They've even got signs up. How many have died on that road? Oh, be careful, we say to them. Be careful. Please be careful. And we begin to worry. We pray on hope. And, uh, and we watch them as they haphazardly begin to travel at high rates of speed down dangerous highways, you know, as I say. And we watch these things happen. And then, of course, when they do shipwreck, when they really go off the rails, we say, oh, no, don't do that. Oh, no, there is nothing you could have done which is worse than that. It's like casting your, your pearls before the swine. And the, these are the verses that I believe the Lord brought to my mind. Matthew 7, verse 6, Give not that which is holy to the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and then turn again and tear you into pieces. Luke chapter 15, And not many days after the younger son gathered together all that his father had given him, and he took a journey into a far country, and there, and here's the words, King James uses this language, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. This is when he takes his inheritance and instead of investing it, he squanders it, he just spends it on all the wrong things. Gambling, prostitution, drinking, drugs, just, oh, no, not that, please, not that. Don't you realize how precious this is? inheritance is and you're wasting it on all the wrong things. You're making all the wrong decisions. You think this is going to bring you happiness. This is going to bring you destruction. This is going to tear up your life. This little moment of happiness when you take this drug and it makes you happy for a few minutes is going to eat your brain cells away. You're going to begin to drool at an early age. You're going to begin to have all kinds of problems and you won't be able to concentrate and you'll do, you'll hallucinate, you'll see strange things. This is not the way to go. And we start seeing this and we start grieving if we love them because of the wrong decisions that they make. I actually saw a music video this week. Uh, not this week, week before as I was preparing. I was on holiday. It was too wet to see anything. But I saw this music video and I thought, it's absolutely perfect. I was watching this. It's one of uh, these uh, pianists that I particularly like. He's an Armenian man. And I was watching this music video. And, and as I was watching it, I thought, oh, I've got to put this on for Sunday. I've got to, I've got to show the people this. And you'll never guess what the title of this music video was. And I didn't know this going into it. Lament. <laughs> I thought, oh, yes. So perfect. Watch this. See if you see, if you see the picture. How gold has lost its luster. The fine gold become dull. The sacred gems are scattered at the head of every street. How precious, sons of Zion, once worth their weight in gold, are now considered as pots of clay and the work of a potter's hands. Even jackals offer 
their breasts to nurse their young. But my people have become heartless like ostriches in the desert. Because of thirst, the infant's tongue sticks to the roof of its mouth. The children beg for bread, but no one gives it to them. Those who once ate delicacies are destitute in the streets. Those nurtured in purple now lie in ash heaps. The punishment of my people is greater than that of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment without a hand turned to help her. Their princes were brighter than, than snow and whiter than milk. Their bodies more ruby than rubies and their appearance like sapphires. But now they are blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the street. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as a stick. Those killed by the sword... Sorry, I just lost my place. Those killed by the sword are better off than those who die in famine. Racked with hunger, they waste away for lack of food from the field. With their own hands, compensate, uh, compassion, uh, with their own hands, compassionate women have cooked their own children who became their food when my people were destroyed. The Lord has given full vent to his wrath. He has poured out his fierce anger. These are strong words. There is something about wasted glory, wasted potential. We notice it, I think, most amongst young people when they're growing up and we see them grow up and we have a smile about our face when we see how beautiful they become when they move from infancy into, into toddler and then they begin moving around and we see them and we see their smile, we see their strength, we see their intelligence, we see uh, their, big word, potential. And we think, oh, that child can really grow into being something special. But then round about teenage years when... Uh, I say roundabout because it kind of is like that. We say it's like a fork in the road, you know, when they come to the place of decision, when they can go right or left, and we're all sitting back in tense, you know, anticipation, hoping that right decisions are made as they come to this. But sometimes it is more like a roundabout than it is a fork in the road. You know, there are several different ways they could go. see that and you sit and the overwhelming question in your mind is why? <laughs> why? You're waiting for some profound moment that's going to make sense of all of it. And they took a perfectly good upright piano and buried it. <laughs> it is funny. It is humorous because it makes absolutely no sense. But this is the whole purpose. And this is why I thought this patent perfectly captures the emotion. This is what we do so often when we see someone else make poor choices. We sit back and we say, why? But absolutely everything going for you. Put your own series of question marks above these phrases. He had a good home. 
Good family. Good job. His wife left him. The kids are beautiful. It's a lovely house and a nice car. Stable employment. Well respected in the community. Why would he throw all of that away? To run off with someone. And he just destroy his whole life. The rest of his life. His reputation is gone. His family is broken. His kids are now turning out horrible. His wife is grieving. And he's not and you just sit with this huge question mark over all of it, and you say, why? Why? It it doesn't make any sense. Why? This is the point of lamentations. This is the point of being able to come to the point where God wants us to look carefully at the decisions that we have to make and the things that we have to do, and just question, just ask yourself the question. Is this really worth it? Should I really go through this and allow things to be destroyed for later me to sit down with my head in my hands, grieving, saying, why did I do this? The enemy is a deceiver. The enemy is good at tricking us into believing that somehow this ridiculous event is actually going to produce something good. He tricks us, and he's so good at it that we buy into his lies, and we say, oh, okay, okay, I'll dump this perfectly good piano in a hole, and somehow this will be good, okay. Everybody else can see how ridiculous it is, and yet, for some reason, we can't. You know the story about the man in Luke 12 who had so much stuff, he didn't know what to do with it. And then he decided, I know what I'll do. I'll bi- build bigger barns, bigger warehouses to put my stuff in. That's what I'll do. I'll tear down the old ones, which are too small, and I'll build some big ones, and I'll just store it up. Instead of giving it away, I'll just continue to hoard it and make bigger warehouses. And then, of course, the words, but God said to him, you fool, tonight your soul will be required. You're going to die. And then who is is all of this stuff going to belong to? It's a horrendous feeling to see good stuff wasted or hoarded instead of being able to give it away. A healthy idea. Good gifts being buried. Do you remember the story in Matthew 25 where Jesus... Well, I say it was Jesus. We're told in the story that it was the master who handed out talents to everyone. And he gave a few, one, and he gave some others two and ten. And and then there was the guy who took his and decided instead of investing it or using it, he was going to bury it. Do you remember? We read the words. I love how confusing they are because he then, giving the excuse to the master as to why he'd done all of this, because the master looks at him all puzzled. He gave him specific instructions. I've given you gifts. All I want you to do is use these gifts. Listen, apply this to you. Okay, Apply this to yourself. God says to you, I've given you all of these gifts. You have these abilities. Do something with them. And you come back to God many years later after having wasted them or doing nothing with them. And this is what you say, just what this man says. First thing, I was afraid. You were afraid. Yes, I was afraid. Okay. And then he says this, and I went and I hid your talent in the earth. And then he, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. But you can just see the foolishness in it. I hid it. I took it and I just buried it. I didn't do a thing with it. God looks at you saying, I gave you a gift to use and you took it and you buried it. Yeah, because I was afraid. Okay. And then he says, as he's giving it back to, to God, here's he's giving the talent back to God. He says, uh, this is, you read the King James and then I'll put it into the paraphrase. He says this, he says, lo, 
There, thou hast that is thine. That's the King James. Instead, you know what he says? There you go. <laughs> there you go. He kind of gives it back to him. God's given you a talent. You've buried it. And here it is. And I've hidden it. And now I'm giving it back. And then we come to the judgment. And we say, God says, where's the talent I gave you? What did you do with it? Well, I buried it. Here you go. <laughs> and God takes it back. And gives it to the man who had ten. I was afraid. Are you afraid? Is that why you don't use the talent that God's given you or the gifts or the abilities or other things? You, you've hit it because you're afraid? What are you afraid of? I would be more afraid of God, to be honest. We have other poor investments. There are instructions that come out in Matthew chapter 6 where he says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. He says, don't lay up all your treasures down here. Invest them. Put them forward. In Luke 18, when you have the young man who wants to do right coming to Jesus, and he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what do I do that I can inherit eternal life? I want to get better. I want to do it right. What do I do? What do I do? I'm trying so hard. What do I do? And then Jesus always hits the nail on the head, and he says to him, <coughs> Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, yet one thing you lack. Simple. Sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And then I picture, you remember Peter Falk when he played Columbo? Do you remember his classic uh, posture at the end when he'd be going out the door and then he goes, oh. Do you remember one more thing? Well, he comes to this and Jesus is saying, you want all of this? Sell what you've got. Give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Ooh, and come follow me. Let's make the, you know, said insult to injury. You're going to sell it all and you're going to move away from home and then just come follow me. Live the life I'm living. Follow the lifestyle that I have. If you want to be like me, you want to have the things that I promise, then give up what you've got and follow me. Ask yourself this question, and it's a challenge that I take upon myself as well. I'm not setting myself up here to say, oh, I've got this all worked out. I'm saying these are the challenges that we face. Let me ask you a question. If God today said to you, I have a specific thing I want you to do, what would anchor you and keep you from being able to do it? If he said, I want you to pick up, I want you to sell all that you've got, and I want you to move to such and such a place. What would anchor you? What would hold you back? Oh, I can't do that. I've got too much stuff. That's what this man said. i got too much stuff. I got, I've got too much invested in this place. My uh, investments have yet to mature. I can't, that, I can't just do that. And God says, I want you to give it all up. This is where the challenge comes into our lives when we say, what holds us back? What anchors us? Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's pride. Sometimes it's history. Let me tell you this. I shared the gospel with an old man. He's over 60. <laughs> he, he, was, he was over 90, to be honest. He was over 90. But I said to him, uh, I gave him the gospel, I shared it with him. And you know his response to me? It made perfect sense to him. He was able to understand it, even in his, you know, having never have heard it before. It made complete sense to him. But he said this, that's just not me. History, see. Who I have been, the life that I have lived, the person that I am, that's just not me. I can't turn... Jesus, because that whole scene is just not me. But he created you. It is you. The person you are is not you. You see? The person that you are is not the person he wanted you to be. He created you. Be who it is that he wants you to be. 
Don't let anything anchor you and keep you back from being what he wants you to be. The adventure is in being able to say, Lord, nothing will hold me back. I'm ready to go forward. Fear? I'm afraid I might die. I'm afraid I might get hurt. I'm afraid I might be beat up. Fear? Good, 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 good reason. And God says, push through. Because it's amazing when you find out that actually if you do it my way, you'll be safer than if you didn't. The safety is in knowing that you're doing what God wants you to do. I want to close with a poem. I never do this. I never, never, ever do this. I was taught in Bible school you're supposed to have three points and a poem. And that constitutes a sermon. I've never preached a sermon. Very, very seldom. But I thought this one's just too good. Some of you will have heard it before and others it will be the first time. But part of this will stick with you. And it needs to. Listen. Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one, soon it's fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me, selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears, each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. So soon it will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep in joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whate'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn. And from the world now, let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bring thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, "'Twas worth it all. Only one life so soon will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has burned out for thee. C.T. Studd. Let's pray.